Now that we're passing the FTX disaster and it's starting to enter the rearview mirror, why isn't the market going up? Why isn't the crypto market going up anyway? Well, it takes a while and we're not waiting for it to go up a little bit, at least myself. I'm not waiting for it to just go up a little bit, recover to that, say, 30,000 price area. I'm waiting for it to go up a lot. And that's where the massive gains are made. When there's a massive shift of money funneling into it. And though Bitcoin may only go up two or three or five or 10 or 15 X, some of the altcoins go up 30 X, 50 X, 100 X. And that's where massive shifts in wealth happen. And that might take a while. Now, do I wish that all started next month? I do. But my wishing doesn't control the market. In fact, I don't have much control in the market at all. What I have to do is buy when it's cheap and wait till it goes crazy and then take profits. And that's how the cycle goes. Well, to give us some insight on where the market's at, Paul from Defini will be joining us as we look at the general markets and how they're going, as well as some of the individual picks from audience members last week. We'll look at the altcoins that you suggest we take a deep dive at. Do note, this isn't financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. Paul is not either. I am not at my command center, obviously. I'm traveling with the missus and uh, having some fun, having a little vacation. So let's go ahead and make it rain on that like button, strap in for the show, and let's welcome Paul to the channel. Paul, Thanks, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Always great to be here. It's nearly the end of the year. Is it the end of the bear market, the crypto winter? Is it the crypto ice age, perhaps? Uh, um, I think it yeah. is. Um, well, perhaps not quite, but there are still some positive signs, little glimmers of hope on the horizon. But I'm thinking that perhaps what the market is thinking here is let's just get 2022 out of the way done and dusted, um, put it in a box, and then move on in 2023. And that's when I think the, the money will start to come in and be invested. You know, I think people need that reset, that that clock to change, to um, kind of look afresh at the market. So we're just seeing the last remnants of people throwing in the towel, I think, broadly speaking. Um, there's, there's a lot to be bullish about on the, in the bigger picture certainly in the US economy, certainly in terms of what's going to come down the pipe with inflation. European gas prices are at pre-levels to the Russian invasion. That's brilliant news. I mean, that's just absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, but I don't think people are going to respond too quickly to that because obviously they, they, if you look at the headlines everywhere, there's doom and gloom and market needs a little bit of a shake out of this doom and gloom, especially in crypto. Um, but I, I just think that there are going to be people circling around looking for, you know, very cheap markets. And as soon as we get those technical signals that things are turning, um, there could be some really big gains coming. Um, but at the moment, from last week to this week, there hasn't been much of a change, to be honest, other, other than, sadly, there's just been a few more kind of breakdowns in price action. Like, you know, I noticed Solana's looking a bit soft, Cardano's looking a bit soft as well. Um, but we also have to put that into the context of the um, thinner markets. So it is likely because the market is a bit thinner here, um, it, we're going to see this sort of price action and capitulation. But I don't think it changes the big picture view. Uh, we just need to wait for it to settle. Yeah, what do you know? There used to be this thing that would happen in January. And, and I remember from um, 2019, the last crypto winter, right? And even 2020, December, um, well, especially 2019, December was pretty bad. And then, so, you know, I was super hopeful for January to be good. And, um, and then January, I felt like I got kicked in the teeth because a lot of the Chinese community, in crypto at the time, um, they had the Chinese New Year, so they sold off a bunch more. And but China banned crypto. That doesn't mean um, there isn't still a lot of crypto buying and selling in China. It just means yeah. 
less. And so, um, yeah, I'm a little bit like bracing because of what I remember from 2019 that like December has been rough and, uh, you know, the last two months have been rough and January, I'm hopeful it will be a little bit better, but remembering just kind of the stuff that went on around Chinese new year, I'm like, Hmm, I don't know how January will play out at all. Yeah, I, I think the only thing we can do here is to play the market as it comes. Um, I think strategically, we are approaching the end of the bear market if we're not already there because the sentiment, mm -hmm. sentiment is so bad. Um, that doesn't preclude another move to the downside, though. That, that's the only thing. You know, the market can be very bearish um, and it can be very bullish and still go up, if you see what I mean. But that's usually the sign of the end of the trend. And given how bearish everybody is, that's usually a sign of the end of the trend. It's just a question of how close are we to the end? And will the market go for the lows, you know, force everybody to, to capitulate and then do like a V low and, and back up again? I mean, I know we're going to look at the markets in a few minutes anyway, but yeah. Ethereum, I've keep saying it each week it's it's just refusing to break its 2022 lows there's not much time left for it to do that now um and it doesn't look like it will but you know i, I can't rule it out either because it's not a bullish pattern it's just n not a super bearish pattern given the news um bitcoin looks a little bit shakier but still it's we are absorbing some monster bearish news here um and it's it's actually holding okay i just can't rule out that last that last capitulation for all the reasons that you're saying because this can be a very strange time of year with thin volumes with the new year like you say with the chinese new year as well actually funny you mentioned china i mean i think the fact that they're opening up the stock markets have been rallying i've been bullish on those markets recently and that's another mm -hmm. reason why i think that there's good reason to be optimistic in 2023 because um, there will be more uh, interest, buying interest generally. And I'm talking about the broader economy here. Um, so I, I'm expecting there to be a bounce back in demand and supply chain problems to ease. Um, you know, fingers crossed there won't be any situations in Taiwan. And I know some people think there's a very good chance there will be, but we just don't know. Um, the only caveat to all of that i would say is that um the tech stocks are sh selling off and not looking great here so there's clearly a reweighting going on tech stocks were, weren't doing too badly up until about a week or so ago and then the key some of the key stocks including apple are doing quite badly so they are but if you look at the big picture trends you'll see that, that they're actually just sort of coming back to their the longer term trends. So if we look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ is very close to its 2022 October low, which to be fair is massive support there. But anytime a technical analyst sees a market near a low like this, you sort of brace, you've got to brace for a break because that's where the risk is. Now there's plenty of support around, but you just got to be really careful. Um, if we compare that to the Dow Jones, which we do each week, you can see the Dow Jones 30 stocks are actually doing really well and um, comparatively much better. So looking at the underlying structure of the market, you might be surprised to, to know that most people are long the NASDAQ and they're short the Dow. So that kind of means that we're probably going to see outperformance next year of the Dow and underperformance of NASDAQ stocks. But I've got a, I keep an eye on a list of key stocks. I try to keep my eye on what the majors are doing. I think we can all agree that, you know, Tesla has been pretty bad. Um, there was a massive head and shoulders top there mm -hmm. and broken down quite, quite aggressively, but stocks like Apple should have done okay. And Apple, even today, as we speak, is just completing a double top here. Um, you know, we, we, we talked to, funnily enough, we were talking about it last week about how the outlook for the iPhones are probably going to be less and less, um, sort of massive gains and more and more incremental and perhaps the market is becoming saturated and this is what the broader market is looking for they've got to reinvent themselves which i'm sure they will um but 
it takes time, investment, and and money in order to turn a trend around that's that big. Um, so I think all, if you look at all of tech, it's it's kind of under a bit of a cloud, but it's only coming back to where everything else was before. If you see what I mean, because it's out it outperformed so you know so much against the major markets during the pandemic. This is just a re-rating. Now, whether this is going to continue into next year and beyond, um, I, I think it probably will. So for now, I would say the weightings look correct in terms of the real market or the, the real economy against the tech stocks. They could continue to be uh, a, a bit of underperformance by tech stocks. But I also think, broadly speaking, next year is um, is going to see a turnaround. So... There's, there's plenty to be bullish about from the, the broader economy. Um, if we look at U.S. yields, as you know, we look very carefully at U.S. yields to see mm -hmm. where interest rates are going. This 4.5%, I think, is going to be where long-term interest rates... Uh, actually, I say long-term interest rates. This is where I think the Fed will settle on interest rates, around 4.5%. Um maybe five, but I think around four and a half percent. So the market is getting used to that. And any adjustment in interest rates when you've had multi-decade, you know, over 100 year lows in interest rates is going to be a bit of an upheaval. But it's the market is getting used to the fact that rates have gone higher. And as long as they don't accelerate higher from here, I mm -hmm. think this is going to be positive. So um, we've got inflation data, obviously, each month. I'm trying to remember what the, the actual date is um, in January. I think it could be the 16th, but don't quote me on that. I'll have to look it up. But CPI is on the 16th of January, so um, which is at a good time because the first two weeks, when I used to work in a dealing room, the head of trading always used to say, I always ignore the first two weeks of January because the first two weeks, you, you're just getting... Uh, very low volume, um, a very kind of meaningless, meaningless price action. To be fair, that related more to foreign exchange. But I, I think it's also, you know, not a bad kind of discounting mechanism to not get drawn into a trend just in the first couple of weeks of January. But it's pretty clear that there's some people who take their holidays in December and there's some people who perhaps who don't have families or whatever decide to take their holidays in January because... You know, it's quiet in December when you're in the dealing room, so it's quite nice to be there. Mm -hmm. And then in January, you can go off to the slopes and go skiing somewhere and have a nice couple of weeks while everyone's coming back to work. So so I think that kind of scenario for how the markets get back to work, it, it kind of works across the board, really. But despite that, despite the kind of seasonal patterns and trends, I do think that the interest rate rises are going to tail off and so we've got to pitch where we think they're going to land where they're going to settle and my guess is around four and a half percent and the reason why i think that is because the interest rate rises that they've done in the past take time to work their way into the system given that commodity prices have dropped a lot mm -hmm. you're going to have a double whammy of lower commodity prices plus the interest rate rises on the back of it Plus, there was some housing data that came out today that was a bit weaker than expected. I saw mm. peripherally. Still didn't look that bad, actually, but it was a bit weaker than expected. And so all these things are yet to come into the system. And then the Fed might look very much like they're going to pause. As soon as they use that language or they feel confident enough to use that language, the stock market's going to go. In fact, I think it will go ahead of it. So that risk on, as we talked about, that risk on environment, will be bearish for the US dollar and it will be bullish for stocks. So this is the chart of the, the dollar index and it's coming into land, as it were. It's coming into this 101, 102 area, which is this longer term trend line. And um, if, we, if I show you a chart of the dollar yen, you'll see what I'm thinking in terms of how it might play out. So if we look at the dollar yen chart, you can see we had a, a move up to 150 when the yen was collapsing, a move all the way down to 130, which is huge. I mean, that is absolutely huge. And and I think, well, here I thought it would start to rebound, which it has done. So I think we'll get around 136 and then it will come down again and make a massive head and shoulders top. 
and then this will go much, much lower in, in 2023. So the next few weeks into maybe the CPI number, the market might anticipate higher rates for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm not going to get drawn into that because bond markets are selling off a little bit. Yields are rising a bit as well. And the dollar has got a slight bid tone to it um, in certain capacities, not everywhere. It doesn't look like it from the dollar index, but there's a few areas where it's bouncing. Um, so there's a bit of fragmentation. So that means that the, you know, the markets are likely to tread a bit of water here. Um, but the broad brush scenario, the big picture that we're waiting for, is for the dollar to, to be accelerating again to the downside and for risk on plays to, to be coming in um, you know, aggressively. And that I still believe will spread into the crypto markets. Initially, the majors, hopefully, um, well, it'd be great if we could see it in the altcoins first, but usually we'll see it in the majors turning. Mm -hmm. I think this turnaround is more likely to be in the majors first because that seems to be the most uh, risk averse way of playing the market. But then hopefully the waves will then come into the um, the altcoins. But I don't know. I mean, that, that's just a sort of broad brush view. We'll have to wait and see how it happens. Um, but I'm still, you know, broadly bullish. And I, I don't think there's any reason to change view. I think there's a lot of reason to be excited for those that haven't been through the crypto winter before. Like it's frustrating and it washes a lot of people out. And even the last crypto winter, see, I, I had some advantage in that when, when I came into crypto, I, I was new to crypto, but not new to investing in investment cycles. And so when we got into the crypto winter, which started, I mean, so, so December 2017 and January 2018 were peaks. And then it fell to its lowest actually within one year. And then we bounced up and then we bounced back down near the lows um, over the next 18 months. And then we took off. But what was crazy is how many people just left the space entirely. Because when I came to the space, I was just surprised there weren't more people. Like there were a ton of people in during the bull market of 2017. Like I came in October and, you know, and I'm looking around at everyone. I'm like, yeah, uh, this is great. And then then it pulled back and I was like, ah, oh, shoot. OK, so I'm starting to understand these cycles. It's going to pull back pretty massively, it looks like. And then it will probably take off in a few years. What shocked me is how many people left. Right. And, and it does get boring. Like it, it it's hard to stick around. But a lot of people didn't know these cycles. So they just left the space. And some of them came back in March of 2021, which is a terrible time to be coming back because that was once again a peak, right? Like they missed all the gains of some of the stuff like Matic, you know, went 200 X, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, projects went crazy. Cardano went 200 X. And so they, they missed a lot of the cheap stuff because they were gone when everything was super cheap and they come back when everything gets expensive and there's lots of excitement again. So we're in that period of most people are leaving. And is this the final capitulation? I don't know if January kicks us in the teeth, that probably will be. Um, it's pretty bad. Like Paul said, like a lot of people are just the sentiment is way, way down. And that's what it feels like when it feels like there's no hope that the economy is just going to crush everything like it, it's bad and it's not going to get any better. Like it always feels like that at the bottom. And that's what pushes so many people out and you create that low. So if you're here and watching this, you're in exactly the right place. You are so well positioned because this is like we've been in this declining market, but at some point it stops declining and you're at the bottom and you're at this upswing and it starts then going up. And a lot of people don't that aren't paying attention don't even notice that turnaround. And they come in way late when gains, 20x gains happen after having already gone 5x. And you figure those together, 5x, then a 20x, the end of that, that's a, that's 100x. If you come into anything after it's 100x, you're probably way late to the party. And so, you know, being here in this time is the best time to be here, even though it doesn't feel like it. Even though everyone's depressed, you jump in Telegram, you jump in groups and everyone's like, oh, this is terrible. And people are like, I'm done. I'm leaving. 
that should be music to your ears that you are in exactly the right place and you are and you'll see because this is how the life-changing wealth happens right so this is what i went through last cycle of course i'm still around now i even know more solidly how this happens it's really hard to guess exactly when the peaks are going to be when the bear market is i thought i would be able to call it better this time it played out so differently than everyone expected once again so i take some consolation that everybody was wrong really um because i thought it would play out generally different than it did but my take profit strategy still had me take some profits and roll them into other things and so a lot went really well for me um and you know the market's down at a low from here to the top is going to be a crazy good ride let's jump into some of the altcoin picked from some of the audience members thank you everyone for your really good suggestions we have some great ones to take a look at today um if you want to make a suggestion for next week you can give us up to two we do prioritize if you take the time to write out what you like about the project and some fundamentals on it um, we'll prioritize it higher because sometimes we get more suggestions than what we can look at so why don't we start with bnb which is kind of in the majors and it seems like some coordinated fud trying to take out binance and i really don't think they'll be successful yeah um as you say this um this is kind of, or as we discussed before, this is kind of similar to the other majors, i.e. the Bitcoin, Ethereum, where they've made their lows. If I could just, if, if it's all right, if I could just quickly flick back to the uh, Bitcoin chart so you can just see how we made the low on the 22nd um, of November, 21st uh, of November, and then it went up on the 22nd. That was the, the fair point. That was where all the selling happened. And we're still above that low. Um, Ethereum is the same, hasn't even broken below the um, the November low. So it's not created a 2022 low at all. So this is this is incredible, really. Um, that it's the only problem with Ethereum is it's in one of these big triangular constrictions, which are normally indicative of a continuation of the trend to the downside so you know, i was quite bullish about the fact that this low had been held here at 1071 and i was looking for a rally i thought we might maybe get up to 1450 and challenge this downward trend line um but it's it's gone back into the range again so it's just it's so neutral here we we just need to wait for a breakout but as i was saying before the sentiment is so negative it's really on the uh, onus of the bears to get this lower um, because it should be lower and one of the things that we look out for in markets is if something's too obvious it's obviously wrong yeah. and um you, you know you just gotta be careful there's never ever something that's so easy you just read the headlines and go oh yeah everyone's bearish let's just short um you know it doesn't work like that and so that's why people who have seen these cycles before are slightly cautious about getting overly bearish um, because we've seen it happen where everyone's really bearish, the market might go down a little bit and then it snaps back or doesn't go down at all, just rallies. Suddenly there's a new sort of positive news on the headline and everybody's changing their view for, and forgetting what they were saying, you know, a few weeks ago. So um, the Binance coin, BNB uh, coin, is, is, is not looking, you know, like strategically very bearish at this point and given the news and given the pressure it's been under and the outflows that we've been talk, you know we've been seeing in the news flow um it's doing relatively well now that doesn't necessarily mean i'm going to jump in and buy it um that's two very different things um i'm still on the sidelines watching waiting for an opportunity but what i would say is it's created major, major support down here. So it, it collapsed and then it was rejected and the market rallied aggressively. So it's put some distance between the recent low and where it's consolidating here. Um, it's also pegged in a low down here at 185, which I would have been quite disturbed by that initial breakdown here because it got into a new low and it broken really key support. So this 213, 215 area, 
was massive. And the fact that it went down there was a bit, you know, unnerving because as a technical trade goes, you would have gone short there um, because it's a classic breakdown. But the market rejected that and went up. And so that traded pretty well. So I'm giving you this, this kind of background as to the psychology of how technically one would have traded it. Because if we think about where we are now, we're at 243, which is still higher than where it was from that breakdown point. So if I shorted it and held the position, which is what a lot of people do, they just take a position and, and just sit with it, you know, it's still not got, got any lower. So I think for the bears to take control, they need to get it below 222 in the first instance. But more importantly, they need to get it through 185. If you can get through there, mm -hmm. then yes, okay, this is in trouble. Uh, I would be a bit concerned about it. But whilst it's where it is now with all the bearish sentiment, I think it's holding up pretty well. And if, if you look at, take a step back and look at the big picture, the trend overall is still to the upside. Now, of course, that can change, so there's no guarantee, but it's just saying the big picture is looking all right. And as you know, when we look at some of these charts, the big picture's not quite as good. You know, you can see trends where the big picture's actually quite bearish and the market's kind of into new lows uh, or, you know, historic lows for this particular contract. So putting those things together, I would say, I'm not going to step in yet, but I think this is a very interesting one to watch because if this shows signs of strength, it will be in the same boat as Ethereum and Bitcoin because it's not doing what the market is expecting, i.e. it's not going down. It's not smooth downward trend. And I would expect people to be short this. So if they are, we'll see the price squeeze up very aggressively, um, perhaps not this side of, the, you know, 2023, um, just because we, we probably need the new year and, and for the, you know, all the capitulation to come out. But if it can absorb that, then I think this will be in a really good space. So um, interesting one. But for me, it's a wait, but mm -hmm. definitely worth keeping an eye on. And it's a good suggestion. So thank you for that. For me, it's a wait too. So let me go there and well so i'm not holding any one of this one because it hasn't retraced heavily um and what's interesting about bnb is looking back on that chart they actually increased in price during the bear market so if you actually take us uh to the left some you can see that during the last bear market they actually went up when everything else wasn't so everything else went down tremendously and bnb didn't now past performance is no you know it doesn't necessarily predict the future so i'm not holding much bnb other than what i need to transact on it and it seems like to me the fud pressure on bnb has everything to do with trying to take them out and i think these are centralized players so some of the centralized players were involved in ftx and they were you know some of wall street had their connections there um sam bankman fried was meeting with gary gensler multiple times um talking about how to regulate the market of course with one of the most corrupt crypto people in this space but he comes from a wall street background and I think Wall Street very much wants to get their hands around crypto. And so Binance is a crypto player that came from the crypto side, is making all this money. And when they, with how FTX fell, FTX was taking loans against their token at a certain price. So essentially they had leverage against their token. And once that price broke on it, then, you know, their, their books collapsed and, um, they fell and I, it seems like these centralized players might be coordinated creating coordinated fud against binance to hopefully take it down so that then there's no massive exchange player and they can come in and bring their own stuff from wall street bring it right over to crypto and that's my guess with a little bit of speculation on what's happening there um however cz is exceptionally smart um, he's not one that they're, <laughs> I don't even know that he is leveraged against the token itself. And so I, I don't know that their ploy is going to work and you've seen them exert all this pressure and not all that much has happened on the token price. 
look, it's only down to 243, so it's down maybe, uh, what is it, maybe 60% from its highs, maybe a little bit over than that, but a lot of things are down 90, 95%, 98% from their highs, so it's been really resilient. I think its highs were right around like 700 or something, and so to only be at 240 three, it's still doing quite well compared to everything else. And BNB performed exceptionally well during the last bear market. One of the things that led to that is CZ kept innovating and giving additional use cases to the token. Now, does he have more tricks up his sleeve? I don't know. The, the problem is you couldn't tell that he had tricks up his sleeve before until it was announced. And then the BNB token went up a bunch more. And, you know, so he didn't kind of say what was going to happen. And then it happened. It just came out. And then people were like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And the token pumped. So BNB, um, I don't hold a lot because I'm buying stuff that are massively on discount so that when the market does turn around, I can do really well with it. So BNB doesn't fall in that category. But for those that are looking for, I don't know, uh, a blue chip cap to hold and they just want to hold it long term, probably not a bad place to look at and see if this fits for them. Let's take a look. What do we have next? Uh, is it Hedera? Yeah, let's take a look at Hedera. Okay, so, um, so Hedera is unfortunately one where i i'd say it's either a sell it's kind of a sell or a wait um the reason being that it's it's still in this downward trend um it's not managing to find supports not consolidating and i think given that i, I just can't step in and say this is where it's going to suddenly turn around just you know just because i'm looking at it and you know, as much as I'd want it to turn around for the sake of the investors, um, I've got to be realistic as to what's going on technically. So the trend has been um, accelerating to the downside as well. So obviously when that happens, well, not obviously, but when that happens, it reaches a point where the trend rate is too aggressive and people think this is cheap enough and they step in. So it breaking a short-term trend line is not as important as it breaking a longer-term one. So we really need it to get back over key support, um, which for me would be around here at uh, like five and a half cents or this breakout point around six cents, um, you know, where it took off from here. I see that as a key area that it needs to regain. Now, it's not all bad news because... Even though it's going down, the nice thing about this chart is it's coming back into this zone of support. So if it gets a bit lower, it's going to look really interesting around, say, you know, three cents or so. Now, you probably don't want it to get down to three cents um, if you're holding it. But if you're waiting for a, perhaps an opportunity to put a small amount in without leverage, then that's not a bad place to, to have a look. Um, obviously, if it doesn't hold this this area around 2.027, um, then I'd say that's that's a that would be a really bad sign. That'd be kind of an ex existential crisis for it, and I'd be a bit worried. I mean, obviously, you've got to put this in context. If everything else is going down, it's going down with it, then it's just doing what the rest of the market's doing. But if everything else is going up and it's still not performing, then you've got to be very careful. Um, so for the moment, I think it's um, it's a sell for me, but it's getting into this zone, this interesting zone of support. So I'd be, I'd want to look at this sort of early next year to see if it's hit the zone of support and then maybe found, you know, some buying patterns that could suggest we could get in and it's, it's at the end of the move. Um, but yeah, great one. Thank you for suggesting it. Yeah, this is a good one. They have an interesting technology. So a lot of blockchain is built on blockchain or a decentralized ledger. And Hedera has a hash graph instead of um, like blockchain. And so it's a different technology accomplishing a similar thing. And it's, we don't know if this is going to take off. There's some, definitely some good pros to a hash graph. 
And so um, it, it's got good potential. One of the reasons I didn't buy it back when it was really cheap before in late 2020, early 2021, before that huge climb was that it was um, – basically a lot of the reserves of the project would be released as the token price increase, which kind of acts as a break against appreciation. And still it went from when I was looking at it back in, you know, the recession when, uh, excuse me, the bottom of the bear market when it was under one cent, um, it went 55, 60 X from the very bottom. But from that, that period when it was about, three cents um it only went about 20x compare that to throwing it in cardano which is where i threw a lot of money and cardano went 100 or 200x and so it did act as a real break against um the increase in prices and so i i don't regret having made that decision but i still look at this one and i watch it to see how well it might do in the future because even though cardano's pulled back massively at the bottom of the bear market in well march of 2020 it hit 1.7 cents and from there it went to three dollars and 40 cents ever so briefly and it's now come down been playing around between the 20 to 30 cent mark um, which is still above 10x from its low before. So in some ways, that's really cheap Cardano. In some ways, it's way up from even what it was at the bottom of the market before. Hedera is getting to a really cheap point, and I hope it does go down to 2.5 cents at that point. I might have to revisit picking some up. Um, do I know if this technology will take off? I don't. It's too early to know. I do think Cardano's done well enough that they'll be around for forever. I think Binance Smart Chain, I've just seen CZ continue to innovate that if he continues doing that, it will continue to make that relevant. ETH is probably here to stay in Bitcoin. Most everything else is a risk, but with the risk comes really good rewards if something ends up hitting. And I, I like to take those risky ones. I like to be in the risk zone where there's a chance some of these will fail because in that risk zone is where you can make the 50x or 100x or 200x gains. And even though if one or two of your picks fail, if you're really well diversified, your returns are still really high. And so Cardano last um, crypto winter was in that high risk zone. A lot of people said they were doomed to fail and that it would never happen. And they called it car Delano. Um, and then we saw that Charles Hoskins had did a great job and, you know, it's actually been growing tremendously. The number of smart contracts on it has quadrupled this last year, even though the market's been terrible. All right. Um, okay. let's go to our next pick. Which yeah would be Cody, which is a great one to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. So this one is, if you look at the chart, very similar to Hedera in, in terms of the recent price action. Um, it's in a more kind of central point from this chart, i.e. The, the trend has been up, it's consolidated, it's come down, it's in, in the, around the middle of the reversal which is always an interesting point because a 50% kind of retracement point is, is often where buying comes in, um, given that the market is effectively driven by human behavior and we love 50% off. Um, I know in percentage terms, it, it's more than that, but if you, um, if you look at how much the market's retraced, just by eye, it's kind of in the middle of the chart. I'm using a log scale just because it keeps the percentage moves um, more in line with um, consistency. So they're more consistent in terms of um, what each small move is. Because obviously the, the lower it goes, the more in terms of percentage uh, points that the market is actually moving. So in terms of what do we do about this, uh, I think it's, it's a weight because the trend is still down. Um, and we need, from a technical point of view, um, we would need to see some signs of buying, some signs of life, um, to indicate that, that we're near the end of the trend. Um, but this is not a bad place for it to happen. Um, so I know what I was saying before was, was uh, you know, quite long, but it's important to, um, you know, to set up what the bigger picture is and these charts. Um, 
So it's in a zone of support. Now, I think that zone of support will uh, extend as far down as this very important level here, which is around three cents, nearly four cents, 3.75 or 78 cents. Um, so around here, it's getting interesting. So if there was to be a reversal pattern within this zone, I think it would look very good timing wise for a turnaround. Um, now, something I haven't mentioned before, which I should really, although I'm drawing in these trend lines and saying it's important for these longer term trend lines to break. Um, another part of the technical discipline is that you wait for a reversal pattern of some kind to be created and then you can get in. Um, so what a reversal pattern is, is just the market consolidating or indicating that there's some power or strength or some buying and then we can buy into the market. Now, you might say, well, why don't you just buy it now rather than waiting for it to make a base? Um, couldn't it just go straight up? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Of course it could. Um, the technical analysis is only trying to work on probabilities. And the probabilities are if a market's falling and looking weaker than the broader market, it will probably continue. But it doesn't guarantee it either. Um, I think this area here that we saw in the chart, I think I'm pretty sure we looked at this before. And... I can't remember what I said about it, but I would have been interested as to whether that is what we call accumulation. So accumulation is when the market goes sideways and sentiment's normally quite bearish at that point, but the market goes sideways. And then you get a breakout and an upward trend, but yet everybody's still really bearish. And that's a good sign because you've got this, what we call this contrary opinion theory that um, Jay knows a lot about from his real estate days. So um, from this point, sort of consolidation there's no guarantee it will go up it has actually fallen with the rest of the market we obviously know what was going on there and it's still continuing to fall so in the very short term there's not much of a bounce there's no like strong evidence of buying which could change but at the moment this is what we're dealing with um but i do like this zone i do like the, i like the way the markets come back to major levels and this major resistance point um, will become a support point. So that's where I'd like to see it um, test and create a reversal pattern. You know, hopefully I'm wrong and it just goes straight up. That would be the best news. Um, but for me, it's it has to be a wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not your pattern at all. Uh, and I like Cody. Um, I remember when they came out with their... Um, stable coin that they're developing which is an interesting concept the way they're doing it an over collateralized stable coin which i don't see why that can't do exceptionally well but when they came out with that of course cody pumped a new all-time highs and it took it to 65 cents and you know a lot of people are like are you buying cody i was like uh no uh, i had cody in the last bear market i made tremendous gains on it it was amazing but i sold it honestly too early. Um, I, but I made great gains on it. I didn't get anywhere near the top. I think the last bit I sold was at like 12 cents or 13 cents. It went all the way to 65 cents. Now I bought it under a penny, so I cannot complain. Um, but I definitely missed the top on that, but I wasn't going to buy in at that price when that those announcements came out and people were telling me, but yeah, their stable coin is going to change the world. And I was like, I, I hope so but I just don't chase green candles and this is a massive green candle. And so you're seeing why, or the audience is seeing why I have that rule, right? Because now it's pulled back and now it's starting to get really attractive again, under six cents. Um, it's getting really attractive. And so now is when I'm starting to look really cautiously again, or like really optimistically again at it, like, Hmm. So essentially it's retraced 90%. Uh, the zone I really love is over 95% retracement for, this isn't exactly a really low cap altcoin. It's a fairly decent sized um, market cap on this, but it's getting really interesting to me. If it continues to fall some more, I'm probably gonna have to pick some up. So for me, it's a wait to, uh, but but I like to buy cheap and I didn't get it at the very bottom during the last bear market where it went to like under half a cent. 
Um, but I got it like at 0 0.07 or points, um, seven cents and 0.8 cents and loaded up. And so made like a good 15 or 20 X on that, even though I sold it way too early. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the next one. And I'm so used to having my like <laughs> triple monitors and everything. So right now <laughs> the one screen. Yeah. Um, so the graph was a suggestion that they want us to take a look. Uh, one of the audience members wanted us to take a look at. Yes, uh, the graph. Now, um, I have a vague recollection of talking about this a long while ago, and I must admit, I can't remember what they do, but being a chartist, the idea of the graph is obviously quite attractive to me. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a little bit of a shame that the chart is looking a bit bearish. I say a bit bearish, quite a lot bearish. Um, we start off by drawing in the main trend lines. You've got this is the first trend line that we can draw. Uh, I always use it from the peaks. So you might see some people draw in their trend lines and cut through price action. You're not supposed to do that. You draw in a trend line from um Sorry, I just steadily put it in the wrong place there. You drop from each peak to the next peak, and this will give you a line. Now, even though it's not close to that line, later on, this line may come into um, fruition. So if it starts rallying up to this line, shows resistance, and then breaks through, that's why we resist the temptation to force this line to where the price action is here, like this. So you might see other technical analysts doing that, Sometimes they make the, the line a bit thicker so it doesn't look like it's cutting through price action. But to me, you have to draw lines consistency with consistency. Otherwise, there's no point drawing them at all. So these are the main downward trend lines. As you can see, I'm being forced to show an acceleration in the downward trend, um, which means that I'm unable to buy this or I have got to go with the trend, which is still down. Now, the market is hovering very close to its prior low, which is always a bit of a concern because it doesn't take much to break that and then that becomes another automatic sell level because um, every low break in technicals is, is a sell and every high break is a buy. Now, I'm convinced that there'll be a time sometime in 23, might even be in 24 when we're looking at everything that's completely inverted and all these charts are going up and looking really bullish. Um, and we can talk about the reverse. But at the moment, sadly, that's not the case here. So I'd have to say it's a wait. But even though I, I think it's a wait, I like to put in some levels where I might change my view or where it would surprise me or suddenly look interesting. And I think a very good place to do that is this seven cents level, seven and a half cents. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that's such a good level is because if it can break back through this downward trend line and take out this resistance as well, which was prior support, it would have made a double bottom pattern. And that's all I need um, for a buy trigger. Um, so that's enough for my discipline to say, look, I'm allowed to take a trade. As it stands here, you might say, well, that's a bit strange to say you're not allowed, inverted commas, to take a trade. But that is the discipline of technical analysis. They say the trend is your friend. Um, until it gives a signal that it's ended. And there is no signal here, so I need to wait. But if it creates what's called a double bottom, which means it's made a low, rallied, made another low, and then is rallying, it's showing signs of strength, and we can buy into that strength. So for me, I need to wait until I see something like that. Um, and 70, oh, sorry, uh, around seven and a half cents is where, the, for me, the main resistance points are. Yeah, this is starting to get really interesting. If you look at retracement, this one has retraced massively. So a $3 high is trading just under six cents. Um, and so the retracement is what? Like uh, 95, 97 and a half percent. Um, it's a significant retracement on this. Um, and it's starting to get really, really interesting. For those that don't know what the graph is, um, going to the website, you'll see it's APIs for a vibrant, decentralized future. 
The graph is an indexing protocol for querying networks like Ethereum and IPFS. Anyone can build and publish open APIs called subgraphs, making data easily accessible. So I remember when this came out, and one of the reasons I don't buy and chase into green candles is because everyone was talking about it when it came out, and it had all this hype and FOMO, right? So it did, if I had bought when it initially, initially came out, you can see it was trading at like under 15 cents, and it went all the way to $3, and I missed that period. Um, that run up because I didn't really know what it was yet. And in the crypto space, there's tens of thousands of projects, so you can't keep your eyes on everything. So I missed those gains and I didn't chase into it, even though at $3, everyone was talking about how it's the next biggest thing and this is going to be so huge. And I just don't chase in green candles. But now I see a lot of red candles and it's come down a whole lot. You are seeing a lot more of their tokens in circulation. CoinGecko is telling us that 7.4 million of the 10 million tokens are in circulation. So there's not a lot more that can be dumped on investors' heads. It's starting to get really, really interesting and attractive at this price. So fantastic suggestion by one of our viewers. For me, it's still a little bit of a way. I just want to see where it goes from here, but it's getting really attractive for me. Um, so it's ne nearly ticked all the boxes, but not quite. Is that right? Yeah, it just it hasn't done much rounding. Um, I just think it's going to drop a little bit more, and maybe it doesn't. If I had a lot of spare cash, I would go ahead and nibble on this. And presently, I don't have a lot of spare cash sitting in stables on the side. Otherwise, I would just nibble at this as a reminder for me not to miss the bottom because sometimes you get busy and you see everything you wanted to see, but you see it about three weeks late. Yes, um, so those anyway. three weeks can be quite important, can't they? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's starting to get really good on this. Fantastic suggestion by one of our viewers. All right, so we also okay. have, let's see. Is it it's engine, engine starter? Yeah, engine and engine starter. Okay, uh, I, I, thought, I thought they were the same thing, but obviously not. So engine, coin, uh, let's see. So this is... This could be engine coin. Yep. Would that be okay? Yeah. Um, so let's have a look at the history. Um, so I'm not getting a whole lot of history here. There is more history. It's cut off a whole bunch of it. And it might be mm. it hasn't been on those exchanges very long. But it mm. goes way back, way, way back. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I, I think for the purposes of what we're looking at here, um, this is it would need to reverse this trend for me to get interested mm -hmm. anyway. So even if there is some long term sort of strategic level that it's getting close to, I would I would suggest that you know this is this is still looking um, quite bearish, unfortunately. Um, so you know, twenty five cents it's traded up near five dollars um this was the closest to forming a reversal pattern like a v low and normally what you would see is a certain amount of symmetry where what the market's done on the downside it rallies in exactly the same way so by this point here you could see that that was becoming unlikely and as soon as we broke this uh 48 cents level here that confirmed it so that for me would be the most important um, support point for it to recover, for it to be, you know, bullish from a long-term perspective. We start talking about, you know, anything beyond sort of six months to two years in terms of a, an upward trend. Um, so looking at the very short term, there isn't much to really go on in terms of being bullish because, as I say, the trend is still downwards. Um, it's still sort of not managing to hold on to support, which there was a sign that this could be an inverse head and shoulders, a very small one. So that would have been okay for a short-term rally, but that's kind of failed here with quite a sharp downward move. So what we're seeing is when the market goes down, it kind of lurches uh, quite aggressively. And then when it consolidates, it's 
it's obviously just going sideways in a very compressed fashion. Um, what you normally see when a market reverses is reversing its trend is a very sharp move down and an equally sharp rebound. So it kind of the bears go, oh, yeah, this is this is straightforward. And they start selling, maybe get a bit complacent. And then the bulls just force the market back up and they, they have to cover their shorts so quickly that it creates this this kind of big updraft in, in price action. So we want to see something like that that really stands out on the chart to reverse the trend. Um, whilst it stays relatively compressed and low, that's a bit of a warning sign for me that there's lower prices ahead. Um, but I would say that it'd be useful to look at the, the longer term chart to see if there's somewhere along the line where we get some support where, you know, there could be some long term support coming in close to these levels. But the net effect of it would be that we would see that sort of rebound, because if the bears, short term bears try and push it down, the long term bulls would be looking at these support levels and saying, right, this is this is great from a long term perspective. And they they pile in and force the market back up. So we'd see pretty much the same effect. Um, I would say that although that sort of 49 cents level, which is quite far away, unfortunately, um, that is where I'd like it to break from a long-term perspective. Um, this 28 level, 28 cents level, was important support. So if it, for some reason, recovers it either before, well, in the first couple of weeks of January, I would say it's more realistic. If we can get back over that, then I'd say that's far more interesting and we can start challenging this downward trend line. Um, so that would be my first tripwire for a bullish trade. But for the moment, I think I'd have to stand aside. Yeah, uh, let me share some fundamentals on this one. This one's so interesting because Engine was one of the first projects to really be talking about this idea of NFTs or non-fungible tokens. So uh, I don't remember when they launched, 2017. Let me see when their price history goes back to on CoinGecko. So they launched, it starts tracking the token on CoinGecko in November 2017. So this has been around more than one cycle, which a lot of projects out there haven't been. And they start talking about this idea of NFTs. In fact, they created one of the NFT standards for an ERC token. And so they had this idea that they were going to help games and be talking to game makers to wrap their tokens inside of NFTs. So that later, like say you have a sword in a game and it's got a hundred engine tokens wrapped inside it. Later, you can always unwrap the token, which would destroy the NFT, but you would get the engine coins out of it. It was kind of their thought of how things would go and how there would be long-term value in the NFTs. And it hasn't played out that way at all because trying to predict the future is really, really hard. How NFTs ended up going is like, you know, a project launched in sometime early 2021 that had some apes. And what was cool about the project was if you had one, you got access to this private like Discord channel and this private area where you could chat. And some really big people in the space bought a bunch of these. So they were in those chat channels and you could chat with some really good investors um, and that was cool. And people started jumping in because of that. And the price rose from their launch price of 0 0.08 ETH to 2 ETH and then 3 ETH. And then um, celebrities started buying them and it rose all the way to like 100 ETH and 150 ETH for the floor price. We know that project today is Port 8 Yacht Club. And when celebrities started getting in, these celebrities didn't jump into the private chat that you get access to. What they started to do was use the picture on their Twitter profile, which who would have foreseen that some 2D art from a crypto space that essentially launched for, I don't know, $80 or something back when it launched would become worth hundreds of thousands of dollars because you could end up using it for clout on your Twitter profile. Didn't foresee that at all. And yet that is how it played out. CryptoPunks as well. You know, if you had a CryptoPunk on your Twitter profile, wow. I mean, you were considered a really smart, savvy investor and 
truthfully, a lot of people, some people were that bought those. You could have picked those up in the last bear market for one ETH, one to two ETH. And one to two ETH back then, ETH was trading for about $100. So $100 to $200 in the crypto punks went to several hundred thousand dollars as well. And so some massive gains were available there. Well, Engine kind of created some of that idea, but how relevant is their foundational idea now? Not so relevant. I don't know. I would love to do an interview with them. I'm sure they've kind of innovated and, and taken new directions, but I don't know what that direction is. So I don't know what their business plan is to continue to stay relevant, but they are one of the players that built the NFT space and the idea of what NFTs are and pushed through the last bear market, continuing to develop and help innovate and create some standards. So they've done great things for our space. Would I buy back in this token? I would have to understand better where it's going. Last bear market, I loaded up on this token because they were one of the pioneers and I made great returns on it. Buying it again. Now, what's interesting is if money comes back in the market, engine's still going to do great. Will it end up being super relevant? I just don't know what their plan is. Obviously, a solid visionary team because they help pioneer what NFTs are today. Will they continue to pioneer that in the future? I'd need to know that better. So for me, it's just a wait, um, even though this project's done great for me in the past and probably will be good in the future. I'd just like to know, because I'm a fundamental investor, I want to know how it's going to do better. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more bullish on the price action of engine starter for the future because I know more where they're going. Yeah, so um, engine starter I might have a look on the other on the uh, coin trade pro and see if I can find it on that because um, just try searching get... EJS and see if it comes up, which is their ticker okay. thing. Yes. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, right, okay, so this would need me to change the, um, the scale. So let's put that to default and then we can get all the relevant numbers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, actually you're right in terms of this looking, you know, more be more bullish than, um, than engine. Um, because remember earlier on, I was mentioning that we needed some form of double bottom or base before we could buy it. Well, this is made a relatively small base, which is which is good enough um, to allow for a bullish position. Um, what we also look for is symmetry. So what we can see is this has made a low here sideways. This has made another low. And so if this is to repeat, we should get a move up to about um, point, point two of a cent. And then we would see a, a retracement and then a move up to um, 0.3 of a cent. So this is interesting. So this could be a, a short term nibble here. I have enough sort of uh, leeway in terms of the way the chart looks to justify it. Um, the only thing that would be a slight reservation would be cyclically what's going on with the broader market. And mm -hmm. um, but this is showing some signs of activity, even though it's small, that's that's good. You know, it's a really good sign. Um, there's a lot of solid resistance. You can see where this this rally tried to, to get through and failed, um, but it's still coming back again, which is a good sign. So it's not hit it and then just gone straight down. It, it's hit it and consolidated close to it. So that gives me a bit more confidence that we're going to take another stab at breaking this resistance. So the prior resistance comes from this support. So this was support because the market found support around here and rallied. Um, then it's broken through it. And now this support becomes resistance. So this is a really key area. So the reason why this now becomes fascinating is if it can get through here, we get a double buy signal because we've got one buy signal from this double bottom, very small one. So it only allows for a short-term trade, which could be to the order of like a week or two. Um, but this other one, if it can get through this resistance, it should encourage a bit of short covering and would take us to the next resistance point. 
So there's enough to say, yeah, have a little nibble, not leverage, just a small amount. And then if this starts to trend nicely to the upside, then we can think about gearing up a bit, maybe adding a bit to the position. Um, but yeah, it's it's nice to sort of see something that, that could potentially be moving up. Obviously, I'm caveating everything with the environment <laughs> that we're in at the moment. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively cautious in the way I approach the markets. But you will see there will come some times when I'll be pretty aggressive. And mm -hmm. there are times to be cautious and go step by step. And there's times when it's like, let's go. This is all happening. <laughs> it's time to load the, bo load the boat. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to those days, I can tell you, because it's, um, you know, it is difficult. It is a, it's, it's a much harder market to find buying opportunities when the majority of setups are looking bearish. Um, but it's also, as you were saying at the top of the show, it's also important to keep your mind open to the fact that things could be going up um, because it's very easy just to shut off completely and say, oh, look, that's it. There's nothing for me to do. And, and then you come back in the middle of January or, you know, early Feb and then find that everything's, you know, rallied massively and now you're chasing the game. So, um, so yeah, interesting, really interesting one. You know, thank you for suggesting it. Yeah, great pick from one of the viewers. So Engine Starter, um, it has some affiliation with Engine in that I think Engine was an investor in, and bought a bunch of their tokens and invested in the project Engine Starter, but it's not run by the same people. And the person running Engine Starter, he came on the channel over a year ago, I believe, and did an interview. I was really impressed with his just understanding his background in crypto because Engine Starter is a launch pad. And it's one of, in my opinion, one of the better launch pads. And launch pads have become mostly irrelevant, but that won't always be the case. Because what launch pads are is new projects coming into the market or launching on them. Well, right now, not very many new projects are launching. And even if they did try to launch, it'd be launching into a bear market, which there's not a lot of people bringing in new money during a bear market. So not a lot of launches have happened. But when the market is going great launch pads become very relevant because new projects are coming in through there and you have chances to make really good gains and so because launch pads aren't relevant their tokens have completely suffered in price so engine starter at the top was about 20 21 cents by coin gecko i think it went a little higher than that and now it's trading for 0.17 cents so is that a 99% retracement? Mm, starts to get at some really delicious levels there. A 99% retracement. Now, CoinGecko is also showing that their total circulating supply is 3.1 million um, and or 3.1 billion, and that the total max supply is 5 billion. All right, so um, that means 62% or so is in circulation already. I like that number is not bad. Um, I don't like to see that maybe only 10% of a token is in circulation, realizing that the project's holding a whole bunch of tokens. They might sell some of those off and really push the price down. But when over 60% is already in circulation, that gives you a little bit of buffer. If the project still has some tokens, they're going to put in the market. They can only push the price down so much. Um, I prefer to see like over 80% already in circulation, but 61% um, or something isn't a bad number at this point. So, yeah, maybe we've hit a low and we're going to go up from here. Maybe we come back down, but this is one to watch carefully. Now, my favorite launch pads are Engine Starter. I really, really like Chris from MM Crypto's project. Um, I'm forgetting the name at the time. Uh, VPAD or VLaunch. I think the ticker symbol is VPAD. Um, fantastic project with a really well-connected guy that is an exceptional fundamental analyst. I followed his channel back in 2017, 2018, and he was reviewing all the ICOs that were launching, and nobody was more right than him. He doesn't cover new projects in his crypto channel anymore. He only covers a Bitcoin price. Um, and it's unfortunately that he doesn't cover those um, altcoins because um, he was the most right person of anyone I've ever watched. But he did start a launchpad 
with uh, his business partner. And so he's really good at screening. And that's why I really like that launch pad as well. All right. Well, that wraps up everything we wanted to look at today. Paul, thank you for joining us and giving us your insights. Always a pleasure. Look forward to talking to you on the other side. Have a great New Year's party wherever you are. Yeah. And, uh, we'll look, look forward to 2024. Oh, 2023. Thanks. <laughs> I know, right? Well, 2023, if 2023 isn't amazing, 2024 will be. Well, I, I think we're going to see, you know, you you're, you cut your teeth in the world of cyclical markets. And that's in the back of my head, I've got 2023, 2024 as being two years where the market's really going to accelerate. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. So me too. Bring it on. <laughs> Thanks so much, Paul. My pleasure. All right. Yes, the market is slow right now and it can be so frustrating being here and you are in exactly the right place. This is where fortunes are made. This is where people go from not a lot to a whole lot in this type of market. And so it, dollar cost averaging during this time period pays huge dividends as long as you're diversifying because any individual project could fail still at this point. But if you're diversifying across multiple ones, you're probably going to do pretty darn well because as much as we've been in this downtrend, downtrends eventually reverse and then you have uptrends. And one of the things that really attracted me about crypto is the market is so volatile. So from the bottom to the top is a significant ride, like a massive ride compared to any other market. You don't have that kind of volatility and that volatility is what can create massive gains. But in order for it to create massive gains, you can't come in late after massive green candles. What does that mean? That means you have to be around in time periods like this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've got our wrap um, that we play at the end. This is just reinforcing the principles that I teach in this channel. And I wrote the words. Charlie from the UK performed it. Hope you enjoy. To the space, chasing all of the gates, chasing yeah. the pumps and all of the hype trains. But like in life, uh, shit, right before you could, was supposed to buy when it was pouring like a rain, making sure. sure. I buy when it's down, don't chase the boats that I miss, uh, cause I always made the time in mind. I take the one out, cause I'm patient like that, and I'll wait for the right time. I sell when it's high, I buy when it's low, they call me rich, they call me smart. I'm just a rainmaker running the show Calculated investments, I don't leave with my heart uh, The principles are simple, they're leaving a lot yeah. Why when it's boring, just gotta be smart yeah. I sell when it's hype, like all the channels they pump it That's when I was selling, your parabolic they dump it They call me rich, they call me smart uh, I'm a rainmaker, making my own start I'm with the future, learning the past Makes the time fly by, years going so fast The game plan is mine, I'll own it now When I reach the top, haters asking me how Cause I'm a rainmaker Investments I love And I follow what I learn Not relying on luck uh, the Time is never better The time like the present The next five years is a gift And it's feeling like heaven I'm committed to learn Studying to know that Nothing comes easy But when knowledge the game show Sticking out this run Cause soon we'll come a bear market Learning and growing And when it's slow would be the target They say it's come out Bitcoin is dead The massive decreases Can get to your head Sticking around The time is better I'm strong like that I'll let the others be fretters Two years time The ball will bring back the games that makes it worth the effort cause here comes the rain So let's go rain makers, let's make it all happen The go with the hate, they the haters be crapping I'm here for five years, let's do this together The time is right, the time could be better They call me rich, they call me smart I'm a rain maker, making my own start I'm with the future, learning the past Makes the time fly by, years going so fast The game plan is mine, I'll own it now When I reach the top, hey it's asking me how Cause I'm a rain maker, investments I love And I follow what I learn not the line of luck uh, Haters be hating The time to slow down Addressing what to say When I'm wearing my crown They're chasing green candles Like someone who was new I got a vision that was bigger Helping me to push through I'm still human And sometimes it is rough And that's what makes me special Simply I stay tough Cause I'm a rainmaker Investments I love And I follow what I learn Not relying on luck uh.